Beneath the Land in Tremors, a new thriller about monsters that live under the desert floor. It's one of the new movies you're going to be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. And we'll also have a preview of the home video release of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is sort of a present-day Western with science fiction elements. It's called Tremors, and the Tremors in the title refer to shock effects caused by giant worms tunneling underground near a small western town where Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward are the handymen. Their first clue that something weird is going on, sheep are slaughtered and another cowpoke is missing. This is weird. This is real weird. Ah, oh, Jesus! What the hell's going on? Soon, like everyone else in the community, the guys are on the run from the monsters who feel the vibrations of people walking on the ground tunnel underneath them and suck them down under the earth. They escape the giant worms, but others are not so lucky, including a neighbor in the town. There are elements in Tremors that are great fun. The idea of making giant worms sort of credible villains is funny enough by itself. And Fred Ward, in particular, is a solid, slightly goofy presence in the picture. But I can't really recommend Tremors. A little of it goes an awfully long way. The other characters in the film aren't compelling. Some of the parodies of traditional horror film conventions are lame. Some of the ways these guys look off camera, you know, strange reaction shots. Uh, there are just so many tricks, though, that you can do with the worms. Tremor would make a cute short subject, it doesn't sustain itself for an entire film. I liked it enough to recommend it, just barely, but I did like it that much, and I thought Kevin Bacon did a good job, and I love the married couple of Michael Gross and Reba McIntyre, who are survivalists, who yeah. have a basement full of hundreds of high-caliber weapons, and they empty every gun in their arsenal into one of those worms, including an elephant gun, until they finally blow it up. I thought that those characters were funny, and uh, I enjoyed the film. I found one technical error in the film, though, and I that saw is... saw a couple, actually. Uh, yeah, uh, there are point-of-view shots of the worms tunneling underneath the desert, and you see, apparently, what they're seeing. Right. And uh, the problem there is that the worms are blind. They can only figure out where you are by listening to the trimmers. So I had a question with that. I also wondered what these worms were eating in all the years before they found this village. And why are there only four of them? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was, it was that, sad I mean, that there were only four. They I must think be that, lonely. Don't I they? think that if they could have taken the picture uh, and broadened it in some way to have another colony of worms show up, uh, <laughs> or uh, if they had, there are other technical errors. When you see, you can see a worm explode in, in the end of the picture. You uh -huh. see it explode before it should explode. Uh -huh. uh, and the, the, I mean, does it ever occur to you that you're an adult with a college education and you're seriously discussing with me the fact that maybe there could have been another colony of worms that I've thought about that. I would. <laughs> would you really, if someone came up to you, would you really say recommend it, or would you say it's a cute idea? Because all I'm saying um, is a cute idea. I would say it's a goofy, dumb, fun movie. Yeah, and for people who are looking for a movie like this, I've seen lots worse in this category. Okay, I, yeah. it doesn't finish out for me for well. Okay, next movie. Our next movie, oh, compared to the next movie, I think I would highly recommend Trimmers. Our next movie is named Ski Patrol. This is from the same folks who, now this is another job for an adult, reviewing Ski Patrol. The same folks who bring us the Police Academy movies, and it recycles the same tired old formulas with the same dumbbell jokes, the same lame brain gags, and the same goofy humor. The movie takes place at a ski resort where the ski patrol's director is a bumbling incompetent. Oh! What in the Sam Hill 
There are a lot of chase scenes in this movie, most of them involving a crazy skier named Suicide, who in this scene wants to take a ski patrol member right along with him. The villain in the movie is Martin Mall, who wants to take over the ski town and turn it into a tacky Big Bucks tourist trap. This is a major destination resort. This could be the biggest money-making machine of all time. The movie is basically about a lot of halfwits falling over themselves and over their skis, while we get jokes triggered by such inspirations as a bulldog with a serious gas problem. Ski Patrol is harmless, I guess, but it's also witless. It's hard to hate this film, but it's even harder to like it. Well, I think you can hate it for not trying very hard. I yeah. mean, there are in uh, the picture started out in its pre-title sequence with some gags that uh, were sort of parroting uh, macho confrontations on the ski slope between two guys. And I thought, well, this might be a little bit like the movie Airplane with its yeah. parodies, but they don't go fast enough. They don't shoot uh, on enough gags. And so, the therefore, it really isn't trying. There, so I hated it for that There reason. are basically two factories in Hollywood turning out these kinds of movies. You have Zucker, the Zucker brothers and Abraham, or is right. it Abraham brothers and Zucker? Who two made, Zuckers. They made... Z, Z, and A. Okay, they made uh, Airplane, they made Top Secret, right. they made uh, The Naked Gun. Right. They make good movies. Right. And then you have Paul Maslansky, who made the Academy, uh, Police Academy pictures in he's this the, movie. He's the producer. And he's the producer, and his factory just isn't up to par. I mean, it's it's making the same genre of movie, but totally they, lacking in inspiration. They don't have enough jokes, and the jokes that they do make aren't funny. That's right. That about sums up the picture. Coming up next, Richard Gere stars as a wickedly crooked cop under investigation in Internal Affairs. If you want to ask me any more questions about Dan Stretch, take me down to Internal Affairs to do it officially called Internal Affairs, and it is refreshingly different from so many cartoonish cop pictures that we've been getting since the success of Lethal Weapon and its sequel. Internal Affairs isn't a fun-loving romp through police work like those pictures. Rather, it's the story about manipulation and vicious power games between men using the police world for added intensity. It's a solid entertainment. Andy Garcia from The Untouchables in Black Rain plays a new member of the Los Angeles County Police Internal Affairs Division, which polices other cops, and he and his partner, Laurie Metcalf, want to talk to Richard Gere's partner, whom they suspect of being on drugs. Hey, Raymond Avila, Dennis Peck, my partner. Hillerman case. Right, at the Academy. They're very impressive. I got lucky. Gear's character is the center of the story. He gains his power by sensing and catering to other people's weaknesses. Here he tries to tempt Andy Garcia with a hooker because now Garcia suspects Gear of being corrupt. She's very pretty, isn't she? She's beautiful. You want her? Well, I want her. Mm -hmm. Another life. Uh, eventually, the film turns into a mano a mano between the two men, with Gear trying to screw up Garcia's investigation of him by making it seem like it's merely a personal vendetta involving Garcia's wife. Start thinking your wife. She's not getting off the way she used to. Well, maybe she's looking. No, no, no. There's nothing going on. Nothing you can point to. But you just start wondering. Yeah. You're talking about yourself, right, then? No. I'm talking about you, Raymond. That's a real good stretch of dialogue, and the whole original script by Henry Bean is very good here. It sounds street smart, and the story takes us into some surprising places. This isn't a cop story just about guns and car chases and explosions. Rather, internal affairs is more about mind games and manipulation and very raw sexuality. It was directed by Mike Figgis from England, who also directed Tommy Lee Jones and Melanie Griffith in the English mobster story, Stormy Monday. Now he's two for two with good films. Mike Figgis, obviously a director to watch. I think so, too. I was really fascinated by this film straight away through because it is a movie about personalities. It's not just a cop movie that, that plugs in the usual elements yeah. from other cop movies. It could be set in another world and still be it, fascinating. It could be, yes. Richard Gere is very good yes. here. Andy Garcia is very good here. The relationship between them is very good. And then also you have Lori Metcalf, I like her. who is the partner. The relationship that she has uh, with Garcia is fun to watch because it's so offhand that it involves throwaway lines and throwaway attitudes. And she's able to kind of present an entire character 
uh, that isn't really written. I mean, she presents it with her personality. This yeah. is a this is a good movie. Yeah. Do you know that uh, it's so rare to find a character of a woman, particularly in an action mm -hmm. picture, where her being a woman isn't her whole issue? Yeah. Or that she's weak? This is just presented as another mm -hmm. person, and she's very good. Gear is to get a lot of credit, I think, for willing to play unlikable characters. Oh. So often, movie stars don't want to get anywhere near someone he as a likable. He is a complete, total creep in this movie, yeah. and he's brilliant at and, doing and it. And I'll yeah. tell you, Andy Garcia, if he isn't a big name now, this will make him a big name. It's a career-making role, and he's really equal to it. Terrific. Coming up next, a small-time gambler tries to go straight in a long-lost comedy made 20 years ago. It's called The Plot Against Harry. You're Jewish? Yeah. Your phone is stopped. Wonderful, long-lost, oddball comedy called The Plot Against Harry, independently made 20 years ago by director Michael Romer. The film was resurrected this past year at a couple of film festivals after the director had shown the film to his kids on videotape. They liked it, and so do I. It's quite unlike your average Hollywood production. It's both more real and more outlandish, mixing mobsters with fashion shows and bar mitzvahs and deathbed confessions. The movie is the story of Harry Plotnick, a small-time New York illegal gambling boss who tries to go straight after he and his chauffeur literally run into his ex-wife and her family. I always knew you'd be the death of us, Harry. Well, okay. Harry's world now expands to include a daughter he never knew he had, now grown up and modeling lingerie. I know what you're thinking, Kay. I think it's in very good taste, Jack. Well, she isn't your daughter. In an effort to gain respectability, Harry goes into business with his ex-brother-in-law, Leo, who suggests that Harry get inducted into a fraternal organization to help his credibility. Here's the far-out induction scene. Brother Plotnik, hear now this oath to which you will swear. If I reveal the secret, Never. may my tongue be ripped out by its roots, Aye. and my heart be devoured by vultures. Swear. But Harry's veneer of respectability wears thin when Leo and his accountant learn that Harry's chauffeur, Max, has kept records of payoffs Harry made to cops to keep his gambling empire alive. What? Well, what are you going to do? You've got to keep records. You put down names. Yeah, Harry. Part of the fallout from Max's screw-up is that Harry is soon investigated by Congress on TV, which shocks his sister, May, who always thought Harry was a legitimate businessman. All I know, Mr. Vitali, is every month you gotta send money upstairs to the syndicate. Money that helps to finance the drug traffic and prostitution. Putting a comic spin on the Kefauver Commission. That's Martin Priest as the deadpan Harry Plotnik, but I think Ben Lang steals the show as the earnest brother-in-law, Leo. He's the guy with that tilted head. Never stop smiling. The constant <laughs> grin and such a good heart. The Plot Against Harry is a very difficult film to describe, and that's what's so good about it. It's a fanciful story, but a lot of the behavior seems real. Director Michael Romer finds humor in everyday mundane events of the largely middle-class Jewish world that he documents, and the seemingly offhand quality of the plot against Harry, I don't think it's an accident. This is a very well-directed film, and it reminds me of the run-on, unpredictable work of a director like John Cassavetti, so much more fresh than the phony Hollywood world we see so often on film. I don't think I will easily forget the world or the character of Harry Plotnick and all of his friends and relatives. You know, I was reading, for, I saw this movie without knowing anything at all about it. Me too. I loved it from beginning to end. Then I went back and I looked at some of the material on it. This guy finished the movie 20 years ago. He showed it to Columbia. Nobody liked it. He showed it to a couple of other studios. They didn't get the jokes. And then it was on the shelf for 20 years until, as you mentioned, he transferred it to video right. and showed it to his kids and they laughed. And I laughed. And I think anybody who looks at this film is going to be fascinated, first of all, by the performances. Martin Priest is such yeah. a sad sack and so just kind of exhausted and he thinks he's going to die. He looks and like Roy Cohn. Losing everything. And then every once in a while he smiles a little bit because things look up just a little bit. And then that brother-in-law of his who smiles through everything. He smiles through sentences that you could hardly even even say, let alone smile while right. and, and And then all the whole gallery of supporting characters and all these people who come in, the rabbis and the cops and the gangsters and the Puerto Rican gangsters and the Chinese gangsters and right. the, 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 the heart telethon, the heart fun telethon, right. and the guy that has the heart attack during the heart telethon. I mean, 
I don't know where to start with this movie. Well, that's the, the, the problem is it's not an easy film to describe. Yeah. Realize that the guy has simply found a lot of slice of life situations, put mm -hmm. a spin on them and that are, that's very funny, mm -hmm. and it, is, it's, it runs counter to everything that seems so forced and, and artificial in, Amer in American mm -hmm. movies. It's, it's a real delight. It's a real discovery. Coming up next, Steven Spielberg's Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is arriving on home video in the next few weeks, and there's a controversy over the way it's being presented for the small screen. Nazis. I hate these guys. Spielberg is not only the most successful director in the history of motion pictures, but one of the most perfectionist. He oversees every detail of his movies, and he's especially obsessed with the quality of their transfer to home video. So that's why Spielberg has been engaging in a tug of war with Paramount Pictures recently and with the nation's video retail dealers. The subject is the upcoming release of his enormous hit film, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It's expected to be one of the all-time home video bestsellers, but when Spielberg requested it be released in the widescreen or letterbox format, Paramount protested. They said there was resistance to letterboxing from video dealers and from the general public, and they compromised by releasing the letterbox version of the film on Laserdisc and Super VHS, while the big-selling standard VHS cassette tape version will be cropped to fit a TV screen. Well, what's the controversy about? Let's take a good look at this scene which is from the cropped or panned and scanned version of the movie. The movie was shot in widescreen, but here you see only as much as will fit on a narrow TV screen, so we see alternating close-ups here of Harrison Ford and Sean Connery. You saw him? Well, what was left of him? I had his shield. What you're seeing here is the way the movie will look on the standard VHS version. Now here's the same scene, letterboxed for Laserdisc and Super VHS. The full width of the widescreen picture is shown, so you can see the complete composition as Spielberg directed it. Sean Connery and Harrison Ford are looking at each other at the same time in this shot, not in alternating close-ups. Alexandre, of course, on the pilgrim trail from the Eastern Empire. Now let's look at both versions at the same time by splitting our own screen. Notice that in the letterbox version, you see both actors all the time, but in the cropped or panned and scanned version below, you see either Connery or Harrison Ford. First one, then the other. One actor is always missing, and so is the dynamic of the two of them looking at each other during the whole scene. I talked to Steven Spielberg recently about letterboxing, and he was feeling fairly frustrated. When one of his widescreen movies is trimmed to fit into the TV screen, he said, he feels like somebody else has directed it. He says that panning and scanning, where they take the widescreen picture and look at first part of it and then another part of it, that that turns long shots into medium shots and medium shots into close-ups, and it puts cuts where he didn't have any cuts. But Paramount says there's still widespread consumer resistance to letterboxing from people who don't like those black bands at the top and the bottom of the screen. Well, here at Cisco and Ebert, we're in favor of letterboxing because we want to see the movie the way the director originally intended it. The strange paradox about letterboxing is that less is more. Just this week, for example, a new letterbox version of the musical There's No Business Like Show Business was released on Laserdisc. The movie was originally put out in Cinemascope, and look here at the Cinemascope letterbox version. Count the stars. There are six stars. Johnny Ray, Mitzi Gaynor, Dan Daly, Ethel Merman, Donald O'Connor, and Marilyn Monroe. Everything about it is appealing. Everything the traffic will allow. Now let's bring in the standard VHS tape version that most people see. And notice who's missing? Two people, Johnny Ray and Mitzi Gaynor. They've disappeared off the left side of the screen. The studios seem to be approaching letterboxing this way. They crop the movies for VHS cassette tape release, and they letterbox them for the Laserdisc versions, apparently on the assumption that Laserdisc fans are real movie buffs who take these things more seriously. Video dealers tell me that letterboxing is catching on slowly but surely, and that is... Good news, especially, I think, for Sean Connery and Harrison Ford, and especially Mitzi Gaynor and Johnny Ray. Yeah, I, I think that it's real clear that you would want that widescreen version if you have a bigger size TV set. I know when people yeah. see it at home, if they're seeing it on a set that's 25 inches, let's say, or bigger, then you can handle the letterbox. People have problems with the, the banding on the top and bottom when they're looking at a small set. The only way you can get it, though, is either the Super VHS version, which is in very few homes, or the Laserdisc, which is much more popular and it's something that we've been recommending now for a few years. 
and it, it is, the image is going to be brighter, and you will see the entire image. And you can get lost in that kind of image rather than the constant cutting, cutting, cutting that keeps you, I think, distance from a movie. The and scanning, yeah. yeah. No, the vast majority of people who are going to see this movie are going to see it on VHS tape. Yes. That's what everybody has in right. their home. And Why not give them a choice? Fair to Paramount is they don't give those people a choice. Right. So if you've got VHS, you've got to look at the pan and scan version, and that means you're going to lose out on 40% of Steven Spielberg's original picture. It isn't fair. They ought to have a choice. Well, some film company will eventually do it. Some video company will, and that'll be great. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. A split vote on Tremors, the giant worm attack set out west. I thought the film had its moments, but far too few of them. Roger enjoyed it a whole lot more. Two thumbs down for the quite awful ski patrol full of stupid hijinks on the slopes. Two thumbs up for Internal Affairs, a very strong macho drama set in the police world with terrific performances by Richard Gere, Andy Garcia, and Laurie Metcalf. And two more enthusiastic thumbs up for Michael Romer's long-lost comedy, The Plot Against Harry, the story of a mobster's attempt at achieving respectability. And The Plot Against Harry is going to move slowly around the country. Mm -hmm. It is definitely worth seeing along with Eternal Affair. That's a, yeah, both of those movies, really good. And The, the, plot, the plot Against Harry, to think that this movie came back uh, out of retirement, so to speak, 20 years right. after languishing on the shelf is a terrific achievement for it. I think it is. That's it for this week. Next time, we'll have a special show on the career and films of Spike Lee, the exciting young director who made, in both of our opinions, the best film of this past year, Do the Right Thing. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Nestle Crunch. It's creamy milk chocolate and crispy crunchies. Chocolate is scrunches when it crunches. That's why you'll love Nestle Crunch. Rice Aroni, the San Francisco treat. Now with 30 flavors, you can serve it every day for a month and never serve the same dish twice. The new Nutrisystem Flavor Set Point Weight Loss Cookbook. Now you can prepare nutritious, delicious meals for your entire family while you control your weight. Magla ironing board cover and pad sets feature heat-resistant coating and attractive designs from Magla Home Helpers.